everything is going to be all right. With your presence, we feel like, yes, we can do it. And Lord, I pray tonight, you lift your children up as they come to listen to your word. But I take absolute control. Take absolute control. We thank you. We bless your holy name for another good week. Wednesday, I should about to commit Bible study. We lift everything onto your throne. I thank you. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray tonight. Amen. 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 Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you, Ada Bank. Good evening. Good evening, church. I'll be uh, Pastor Mana. We is um, celebrating the birthday of his wife today, so I'm standing in for him. So we wish him a happy birthday. Uh, we, we wish her happy birthday. So um, let us pray. Father, we thank you, O Lord, once again for bringing us together this evening, O Lord, to study your word. Father, to be said, O Lord, to, to bless your word, to announce your words, O Lord, to be said, Father Almighty, to consecrate all the hearts that we hear of this evening, O Lord. Use me, Father Almighty, as an instrument of communication, O Lord. Do not let us be here alone, but do us of thy word. At the end of this session, O Lord, do not let our lives be the same again. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, Father, we pray. Amen. Amen. Yes, this evening, we are going to study a very, very important uh, moral virtue in, in one of the letters written by the author of uh, Hebrew to so the Jews, and that's coming up from the 13th chapter of Hebrew. So we're going to start from um, verse 7 tonight. And um, we, 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 will, we will be able to go through <coughs> to wherever the Spirit leads us tonight. So I'm going to read um, Hebrew 13, verses 7 to 17. And uh, tonight we will definitely need to have our uh, Bible beside us and also our pen and, uh, <coughs> and paper. So that there will be so many uh, uh, scriptural passages that will be coming up which I will want us to jot down and then you can read them at your uh, spare time. So <coughs> the, the um, chapter verse 7 is a, is a concluding religious direction. So it's a kind of a direction that uh, the Hebrew is, the author of the Hebrew is giving to, to us tonight. He said, remember those who rule over you who have spoken the word of God to you whose faith follow considering the outcome of their conduct let me take it again he said remember those who rule over you those who have spoken the word of God to you and whose faith follow Considering the outcome of their conduct, verse 8, he said, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Said, Do not be carried about with various and strange doctrines, for it is good that the heart be established by grace, not with food which have not profited those who have been occupied with them. We have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle <coughs> have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned outside the camp. Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Therefore, let us go forth to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. For here <coughs> we have no continuing city, but we seek the one to come. Therefore, by him let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God, 
that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. But do not forget to do good and to share, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. Obey those who rule over you, and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls, as those who must give account. Let me take that one again. Say, obey those who rule over you, <coughs> and be submissive. <clears throat> for they watch out for your souls as those who must give account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief for that will be unprofitable for you. We have been studying it for, for almost a year now about the different aspects of leadership. And here we come again tonight <coughs> on this first uh, uh, verse we are going to read in, in verse 7 of the uh, 13th chapter. What is the author saying here? He said, remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. The word leaders it means it's used three times in this chapter. The verb means to be in a supervisory capacity, to lead, to guide. And in military terms, it's leader is and in Christian congregations, Christians are giving three commands regarding leaders. And what are these three commands regarding leaders? He said, imitate their faith which we have just read in, in that Hebrew 13.7, imitate their, their faith, that is, copy them. To obey them and submit to them, as we, are, as we have read in, in, in the last verse that we have just read, obey those who rule over you in verse 17. And then the third one, he said, greet them on the author's behalf, which is Hebrew 13.24. Uh, Here the author says, remember your leaders, who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. In this verse, he is speaking of leaders who have since died, not, not the present leaders. The author is referring to those leaders that have already been dead since he spoke the word of God to you in the past tense. And how did they live? How did they die? We are to give careful thought to the outcome of their way of life or their conversation. So the word now, it refers to conduct expressed according to certain principles, way of life, conduct, behavior, it's not what they said as teachers of the world, but how they lived that validates their lives. Such leaders we are to imitate, to use as a model, to emulate them. So what are we saying here? All of us today, we are where are, we are today because we, 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 we have been modeled, we, we, we have been following some, some example. We've come across a lot of people in our life. The leaders can be your father. The leaders can be your teacher. The leader can be a, a friend that is older than you. The leader can be a civil servant. It can be head of state. So, so that is what the author is now saying that that we, we all of us grow up copying somebody and they are dead today but their conversation their their quotation their words are still are still they, they, they said that he said that um um he said he said the sword he said the pen is mightier than the sword 
a lot of people they are dead today but they are still being remembered as if to say they are still alive because of their writings because of what they are written put, put down the type of their way of life and such people like uh, um, like, like Abraham Lincoln we can't forget him like Nelson Mandela and coming home here like like uh, uh, Martin Luther King these are all the people that are, they are all dead but they are, their writings are still reminding us of who we are encouraging us and that's what the author is saying some people because we, we, we used to believe that the, the, the sons the sons of parents they grow up emulating the example of their father so in other words we men are role model for our own children especially the sons and that is where we have to be very 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 careful once you get married and you start uh, bearing children and, and some of them are males you have to remember that whether you like it or not they are going to follow your way of life because they are looking upon they are looking at you they are looking or they are looking to uh, expect a certain standard from you and that is what <clears throat> Pastor Mana was teaching the other day that there are three things in this life they put God first and then put your family second and put your church third as he said because why is it because a lot of pastors a lot of overseers today they are very good they, they are very vast in the scripture they are very religious but, but what about their children their children are not are, are not different from the children of uh, prophet Eli. prophet Eli, he served god all his life prophet samuel he served god all his life but he didn't have time for his own children so a lot of bishops today they are running about the church running about the uh, preaching the gospel of jesus christ all over the whole globe they have no time for their for their family they have no time for their children they, they are either fasting or, or bury their head in the bible or watching the tv or, or scripture and they don't they don't even have time to listen to anybody but that is not the way to serve God. Even Jesus Christ, who is the Son of God, he was a listener. So, so, so tonight we got to study exactly what what the role we should play, the role the role as leaders, whether we, whether we are men or women, what kind of role should we be playing? So the author now is now writing about the the leaders that are dead. Now I'm convinced that one of the reasons we need to attend church is to have before us the lives of leaders who can be role models for our lives in faith, in love, and Christian maturity. So, so that people are going to church not only to go and sing, not only to go and worship, because one thing is you go to church and there are so many kinds of churches. You can go to church that will draw you nearer to God. And you can go to another church that will, 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 will draw you further away from God. Because, because every church is not a church. There are churches that, that, that they, they are Christ-centered. And, and, and that kind of... The, 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 Jesus Christ is the role model of that church. Everything, the, the core principle, the, 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 their core values are the core values laid down on the foundation of Jesus Christ. So they don't deviate, they don't compromise their faith at all. And they, so the people that are growing there, you take your children there, the children are growing up in such churches. They can't go, they, they, can, they, they can never go astray. So that, so, that, so that we go to church, so that we can meet leaders who can be role models for our lives in faith, in love, and Christian maturity. Uh, and this is this is this is indicting all leaders in Mount Zion Fellowship Church tonight, whether you are a man or a woman. That that some people are coming to church, they are watching all of us, how we are living our life, because they want to, to, to be able to grow in faith, 
they be able to grow in love and then Christian maturity. And being around them makes us better for their way of life, corrupts of all us. In other words, what he's saying is that you associate with a leader, that leader can lead you to Christ. That leader can, 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 can uh, uh, um, encourage you to love God. That leader can, can stimulate you. And, and, there are some, and there are some leaders who you follow them, they lead you astray completely. They, they make you complacent. You develop spiritual lethargy. So that is what the author is saying now. So that, so that then what, what are we now thinking about? Because I, I, I was, I was discussing with them, my general Basia this morning, because I just had a, 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 a when I was sleeping at around two o'clock at night, he just asked me, Pastor, Pastor Lambo, he said, what, what is, what is, what, what do you understand by, by core values or core principles? Core principle, or core values. I said, what? But I used to sleep with pen in, near me, so I just. I just took the pen. I wrote call, call principle, call value. When I woke up this morning, I tried to check it up. Then I called him. So he started explaining to me. And, and what are these, is it, and, and these are the responsibilities that, that we expect from godly leaders. Godly leaders in the church. You see, many writers agree that there is a leadership crisis in the churches of America today. But they do not agree on the solution to the problem. Many import American business principles into the local church without much regard for what the Bible says about the requirements and responsibilities of church leadership. They import American business principles. And that is also going on in Africa today. Because uh, my, my son took me to a church in Africa and that church runs Three, three, three services between 7 a.m. and 11 a.m. And, 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 and it's packed full. It's packed full. The three services are packed full. So you have to go there with your pen and notebook. And as the, as, as the, as the pastor is preaching like this, he's giving you business tips. How you can set up your business, how you can do this, how you can maximize your profit, how you can do that, how you can... And everybody just jotting down. Everybody just jotting down notes. And as soon as it finishes, we all troop to the to the to the media uh, media sector because as as it's finishing, it's, uh, everything is about 25 minutes, and and the machine is rolling out the the the, the CD. So they so that we are paying ten ten dollar ten ten dollar to buy the CD. So they are making money. But, but this is what now the, the, the author of the Bible is now saying that, that many writers agree that there is a leadership crisis in the churches today, not only in America. But they do not agree on the solution to the problem. And many, they import American business principles into the local church without much regard for what the Bible says about the requirements and responsibilities of church leadership. It's not business acumen. Even though we are steward for Christ to manage what God has created for us, because God said that going to the world and take dominion over what I have created, that is to be a steward for it, but not to compromise. So those many modern pastors today, they minimize their responsibilities of pre preaching God's word and focus rather on being the CEO of the church. And as church entrepreneurs, they envision and implement growth plans. How can the church grow? We read them every day. I read them every day in my, in my, 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 my email. The church plan, the leaders, leaders forum, how can we grow? How can we grow? They, 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 they be telling you that they're going to sell you packages. They're going to sell you a, a business plan, how you can grow your church from 50 for for the nomination of a uh, congregation of fifty to to one hundred from hundred to five hundred for five hundred to one thousand is a webinar you pay for it and they give you what you go to preach in other words you are, you are going to preach to the people what they want to hear 
And as long as you are preaching to people what they want to hear and you are giving them whether they are false hope or prosperity or, or better life, people will be coming to that church. So so that so that you don't really have to be a Christian to, to, to be a master in that business uh, 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 to have that business acumen. Because it because it doesn't have anything to do with the word of God. It is how to grow the church. So that is what he is now saying. They write how to books, you see, books that share their proven principles for building the church. Now, if scripture is sufficient for life and godliness, as we read in Second Peter, Second Peter, let us just read Second Peter uh, uh, chapter one, verses three to four. <coughs> He said that um, according to his divine power had given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that had called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceedingly great and precious promises that by this ye might be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through loss. Write it down. Second Peter <coughs> 1, 3 to 4. And it equips God's people. He said, if scripture is sufficient for life and godliness as we have just read in Second Peter 1, 3 to 4, it equips God's people for every good work as, we, as, as also we have already read before in Second Timothy 3.16. 2 Timothy 3.16. What did he say? He said, 2 Timothy 3.16. He said, all scriptures is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrines, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect through furnished unto all good work. Everything is in the Bible for us. So if you say something that about the important matter of church leadership, since Christ promised to build his church, as we have already been assured, we read in, in Matthew 16, 18, he said, Upon thee, Peter, I will build my church, and the gate of hell will not prevail against thee. So that, so that's, that, that, that was the promise Jesus Christ read in Matthew 16, 18. So we should look to his inspired word for the direction on, on what God on what church leaders should be and what they should do. Now, in order for the church of Christ to survive, the spiritual attacks of modern human principles in leading the church, we need now to start redefining leadership role in the church. What is godly leadership? And that is why tonight's uh, study is so important that we are not going to rush it we are all of us guys are going to interact together what what do we mean by godly leadership is it godly godly church li, godly church leaders are responsible to lead god's flock by working personally with god and by working together to help church members to do the same so all leaders are working together with god and they are also working with the members to do the same. So there are four main aspects of this statement. One, godly church leaders are responsible to lead. Godly church leaders are responsible to lead. That sounds like a tautology, but it, 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 it needs to be said. Because when you say a leader, obviously you mean he has to lead. But the New Testament does not teach a distinction between a clergy and a laity, in that every believer is a priest with full access to God. So whether you are an elder, you are a pastor, you are a deacon, a deaconess or deaconesses, there's no distinction at all. Your job is to lead, in that every believer is a priest with full access to God, as we have been assured in First in First Peter two nine. But it does, it does teach a distinction between leaders and followers in the local church. Now, the New Testament uses different names of or titles to refer to church leaders. And what, what are they? 
and they, they call them elders as we have, have as we have been teaching be, before in Acts of Apostles 2017 which refers to maturity in the faith elders elders are supposed to be matured in faith at other times there are the alcohol overseer which we have already also studied in first Timothy 3 1 and 2 which refers to their function of superintending of the church in first uh, that is in, we, we read it in titles before titles 1 5 and 7 and as of pastor 17. so the two terms are used of the same office they are called pastors in ephesians 4 11 where he exhorts the elder to shepherd to shepherd means to, to pastor the flock of god among you exercising he goes on in verse 4 to say to refer to jesus christ as the chief shepherd so in other words is we, we, we are also being referred back to jesus christ as a good shepherd so another word for church leaders in the greek is Pres it, 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 that the, we, we used to call the methodist pre uh, precipita <coughs> so so that so that um, we have a job to do and and the the second one is that a godly church leaders are responsible to work personally with god godly church leaders are responsible to work personally with god how do you work personally with god you see, in First Timothy 4.16, Paul exhorts his younger co-worker, pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. And in Acts 20.28, 20, he told the Ephesians elders, be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock. Our text brings out four aspects of the personal work of church leaders. I'm going to make it available to everybody. He said one of them is godly church leaders must be careful to maintain a good conscience before God and others. A godly church leader must be careful to maintain a good conscience before God and others. What do we mean by that? He said Paul told Felix, if you remember, <clears throat> Paul appeared before King Agrippa and 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 the Felix the governor because when 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 uh, 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 Apostle Paul was was beaten up in Jerusalem and they were going to kill him it was when the Roman uh, 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 soldiers rescued him uh, and um, his nephew got information that that they were going to ask the 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 uh, 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 the centurion in in in, in uh, Jerusalem to send to send Paul to them. He said they have said they have, they, they taken an oath that they were, they were assassinate him. So he sent him to Caesarea to governor to, to governor Felix. And Felix was expecting that Apostle Paul would give him bribe because he didn't find any fault in him. But, but, but we cannot expect Paul that he's going to give uh, Felix any bribe. So so he retained. Paul in Sicilia for almost two years when when King, uh, uh, King Agrippa now visited him and that was the time that Felix asked King Agrippa that there's a, a man here the Jews accused him I don't know what he has done but he's not worthy of what they want him to do to, to kill him so so that was the time Agrippa now, Agrippa now asked uh, uh, Felix to invite um, uh, Apostle Paul to come and uh, talk to him so Paul took Felix in Acts of Apostles 24, 16. I also do my best to maintain always a blameless conscience before God and before men. The conscience is that inner sense of right and wrong that God has put in every human heart. As we read in Romans 2, 15. So everybody has a conscience. It is not infallible. In, in other words, it is not infallible. It means that it, it is it is it, it, it is not perfect. In that it must be informed by God's word of truth, so that your conscience can be corrupted. Because if 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 if, if it is infallible, then there will be no sin. 
but, but the conscience is not infallible. It can be corrupted by, by, by doctrines, it can be corrupted by what we are watching on the film, in, 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 by, by, by what we are listening to, by pornography, by different things, by following, by, by, by emulating uh, 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 ungodly people. Our conscience can be corrupted. And that's when they say they, they don't have any conscience, because if they have any conscience, they will not be doing what they are doing. But now what so the author is now saying that but you can perfect you can you, you, you can you, 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 you can uh, uh, polish your, your, your conscience through the word of God. So 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 that so that so that in, in that it must be informed by God's word of truth. It can become seared or hardened. As we have already studied in First Timothy four two, Ephesians four, eighteen to nineteen. Even if your conscience is misinformed, it is always a sin to violate it. So, which means that what the author is saying is that you don't have any excuse at all. That I stole or, or committed more adultery because, because somebody has influenced me, so I'm not guilty. I'm guilty. That's what the author is saying, yeah. That you are, everybody is responsible for sin committed by him. So thus Paul told Timothy in First Timothy one five, the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. The main way to keep a clear conscience is to walk in daily obedience to God's word. If you knowingly sin, Confess it immediately to God and seek the forgiveness of the one you sinned against. Personal obedience to God is the prerequisite to leading others in obedience to God. Personal obedience to God is the prerequisite to leading others in obedience to God. So that is one of the four aspects of godly leaders in the church. The first one we have just discussed and said godly church leaders must be careful to maintain a good conscience before God and others. And then the second one said, Godly church leaders live with a few a view of answering to God someday. Hmm. Can you believe it? He said because every every act, every statement, every word, everything we do to lead other people, one day we are going to be called to give account of our stewardship. So we are not going to get away with it at all. That is what the author is saying here. He said that godly church leaders, they live with a view of answering to God someday, which is which, which I've just read in, in, in chapter 13, verse 17. They are continually cognizant of the fact that they will give an account to God both for their own lives and for the church over which God has placed them as overseers. No man or group of men has final authority over the church. No. We are merely under shepherds accountable to Jesus Christ, the chief shepherd. So it is his church, not mine. Church leaders are stewards or managers of the church for Christ who bought it with his own blood. Keeping this fact constantly in mind prevents any abuse of authority or any taking advantage of people for personal gain. Every church leader should read often Ezekiel 34, where God confronts the shepherd who have not tendered and cared for his flock, but have used it for their own selfish ends. He will call us to account. Let us quickly see <coughs> Ezekiel 34. Ezekiel 34. Mm. Okay, is, I will just just look look for Ezekiel 34 while I carry while I carry on teaching. Ezekiel 34. <coughs> now this, the third one now is godly teacher are men of faith and prayer who encourages other to pray. Godly leaders are men of faith 
and prayer who encourages others to pray and which is what we have just read in, in verse in that uh, verse 7 verse 7 of, of chapter 13 in verse 7 the author tells the Hebrews to remember and to imitate the faith of the leaders who have gone before them in verse 18 he asks them to pray to pray and that's what he did he, he asked them to pray for him and in verses 20 to 21 he modest prayer by praying for them and that's what we have just read in Hebrew 11 on faith here is precisely where American business principles do not apply to the local church the church is not to be run as a business where we make plans and implement those plans according to the best of human wisdom the church is to move forward by faith in the living God and by dependence on him through prayer our aim as church leaders is certainly not to lead by our own collective wisdom but rather to seek the mind of the Lord for his church as we wait upon him by prayer and faith speaking for myself and I'm sure for all the leaders too I'm in a way over my head I don't even have all the answers that I need to lead this local church I don't know enough to guide people through complex personal problems nobody does so because of this prayer isn't just a formality at the beginning of elder meetings or counseling or even this Bible study too, we pray for God to lead us. We pray for God to open our hearts, for God to consecrate our hearts, for God to speak through us. So it is an essential lifeline to the living God. Everything that we do as a church should be done through prayer and through faith. And then the fourth one, is said, godly church leaders are willing to suffer for Christ if need be. The author mentioned Timothy who has just been released from prison. Paul had exhorted Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.8 Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. Apparently, Timothy had followed Paul's admonition. We easily could face persecution for our faith in the years ahead and the leaders are always the main targets for the enemy even if you do not suffer persecution from without leaders must be ready to suffer criticism and personal attack often from those in the church we know that because there is no perfect church and no overseer and no pastor can place the whole congregation he has to, he will still offend somebody because he's not going to compromise. So, leaders who hold family to biblical truth will face such attacks because no matter how kindly you say it, God's truth always offends someone. They don't dare attack God directly, so they attack the leader who delivered the message. So, it is never fun, but it goes with the job. And that is what we are saying. So that, so that, so that, and, and so now we are, we are now going to to, to uh, delve into one thing, and and, and that is um, we we have here. He said, he said, church leaders are responsible to work together. Leaders is plural. Leaders. The New Testament clearly teaches that leadership in the local church is to be plural. In Acts of Apostles 14.23 Plural leadership is a safeguard against the abuse of authority. Also, the task of shepherding a local church is far too great for one man unless the church is very small. And we thank God that we are exceptional in our own church, man, Zion Fellowship Church. As big as we are, at one time we had seven pastors. And people start to wonder, what are you doing with seven pastors? In my own former church, before I, before which I left, we are a congregation of about 200 people. 
and we are only two pastors. But in Mount Zion, we are, we are, we are, we, we, we and, and we, we thank God today that all the pastors are gainfully employed in the, in the service of God. No one, none of us is irrelevant, none of us is idle. So there are two implications of this truth. One, godly church leaders are called to work together. In our own text, the author works closely with Timothy in, in Timothy 13.23, and with the leaders of the Hebrew church, he tells the church to greet their leaders. It is the leaders plural who keep watch over the souls of the flock. So before we now go to, into, into details, uh, I want us to go through where, where Jesus Christ come into the show. Because, because the author now went forward, he said in verse 8, he said, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He said, do not be carried about with various and strong doctrines. Now, the question that um, comes up, it, 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 it's um, about, about this leadership uh, thing we are not talking about. It, it, it's, uh, do we have anybody here tonight that, that uh, has experienced a, a, a kind of a, a situation where, where, where you, 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 you regret or you, you see some people that have been led astray by, by bad leadership in, in the church or in the office or or, or at home. Do you, can you can you recall anything? Uh, because uh, look at what is happening today. Look at uh, look at what is happening today in America. Now we are we are we, we are coming to that one. He said, now, in the final sentences, that, that is in, in, in that uh, chapter 8, uh, in, verse, in that verse 8 that we have just read now. He said, do not be carried, he said, he said, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, here in the final sentence of Hebrew is a gem that has inspired millions. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, is the same today, and is the same forever. At first glance, it seems to stand alone with little context, but upon reflection, it, it follows verses 5 to 7 that you have been read. It says, one, God will never forsake us, which is with what we, we read in chapter 13, verse 5. Two, God is our helper, which is what we read in, 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 in verse 6. Last, last Wednesday and they said referred leaders have died in the faith but are no longer present with us that is that is respect and follow and honor the leaders that have died in the faith but they are no longer present with us as we have just read in today's verse 7 and then, then the last one said Jesus Christ has never changed and is ever with us forever as we have just read in verse 8. Now, what are the implications of this verse? Like God the Father. He said, I am that I am. The external existent one, that is Exodus 3, 14. So Jesus continues eternally. is the past, present, and future. He is the Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end, as we have already read in Isaiah 41, 4. Now, this means that the promises that Jesus made when on earth are eternally true and in force. Jesus, who forgave and saved men and women in the first century, does so today. He who healed leprosy, blindness, and grave illness, who raised the dead to life, can do so today. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Now, theologians may limit miracles to apostolic days because me too, I'm guilty of this offense because I, I, I often ask um, my pastors, do you still have miracles today? And why is it that pastors today can no longer perform miracles? 
because Apostle Paul and, and, and all, all the disciples, they, they were performing miracles. Even after Jesus Christ died, Stephen, Apostle Paul, all of them, they, 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 they were not with Jesus. But they were performing miracles. So, 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 so those, those miracles still, still, still exist today. I once asked Pastor Mana that. He confirmed, said yes, he said miracles, of, he said, miracles exist today. So I'm going to ask you tonight to in what does miracle manifest itself that you can record? Because one thing is we were we, we, according to the Bible, we've already been used to to, to seeing a crippled man getting up and, and start walking. We see it with our own physical eye. We see a blind man, Jesus touched his eye, he opened his eyes, he could see again. And then we say this is miracle. But there are other miracles too. There are other miracles too. Because I've listened to some women in the church. They, they were they were to go for, for 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 breast cancer operation. And they pray for them in the church. And when they went when, when they now went to, 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 to the hospital, the doctor could not find any 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 uh, uh, cancer uh, 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 <coughs> germs in, in, in their breast. They couldn't find it. So, 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 so and, and, and that is a part of, that's a kind of miracle. Many people have suffered a lot of things that they need operation to go to hospital for operation, but when they now get there, the doctor says, I can't find it. And, and, and the x-ray shows that there was something there. Uh, last week, the diagnosis show everything is there, but when they now go to the hospital, they couldn't find it. And we've already experienced that even in our church before too. So we are going to share our experience tonight to find out exactly does miracle still exist today? You see? So so that this means that the promises that Jesus made when on earth are eternally true and is still in force. Jesus who forgave and saved men and women in the first century does so today. He who healed leprosy, blindness and gave and great illness who raised the dead to life can do the same today. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. So whether the theologians dismiss the, the existence of miracle or limit it to apostolic days that it was in the early days and by their unbelief achieve a self-fulfilling prophecy but they cannot bind the living Christ we are people trust him today. He is still active with the same power that was seen in the first century. He is the same. He does not change. In times that writer of the Hebrew has laid down, because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them as we have already treated in, in chapter 7 verses 24 to 25. So so the, the question we're going to ask ourselves tonight is what is the significance of this verse? That, that is uh, verse 8. What is the significance of this verse? That Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today and forever. For you, what is the significance in the, in, 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 of this fact that, that, that is when, when the author wrote this verse to the to the to the uh, uh, Jews, what was he talking about? And then what does it mean to you today? And for understanding just who Jesus is, for believing in the power of God for today. So now the question I want to ask tonight is. As, does anybody believe that there's still miracle today? And if there is, can somebody give us an example or share your testimony of where you have already witnessed a miracle in your life, or miracle in the life of other people, or miracle in the life of your fellow brothers or sisters, or, or worship in the church? Because we need to know. We need to know. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. But to answer your question, I still think our miracle exists today. We still 
see miracles happen in, uh, in our present life. So, right. um, because again, if we go back to the Bible and we talk about the definition of miracle itself, yeah. it, it doesn't necessarily have to be just opening, opening someone's eyes to see. Uh, yes, we have those physical miracles that manifest That's physically. Right. But you do have miracles that happen that uh, are not manifest to others, but you know within yourself that you cannot explain what just happened. That's right. It is a miracle. Um, You see people, that's a typical example, someone driving a car down the road, a truck comes through, and uh, by all imagination or all explanation, you would expect that truck to hit your car, but you, for some reason your car gets across the side and a car ahead of you or something, That's right. you know, you have saved from that situation. That's right. So that's an experience. That's, that's right. a miraculous experience that you just, you know, uh, uh, just had. That's right. So the, um, the, the, this one miracle, um, it, it varies and... <coughs> Um, and they, I mean, and the way we can we encounter those miracles vary from person to person. But I still think that miracles do happen. That's right. Um, people still heal. They still heal you today uh, by miracles. Um, the, 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 the question is: Are they being documented as well as the miracles that Christ? that were documented and Christ himself That's said right. that we we'll, we'll perform miracles That's you know, right. greater things that we will do obviously. so so that's my, my perspective on that but a question I was going to ask pertains to a, um, a previous statement yeah. about um, whether the church um, should be run or the can can be run or should be run as a business or by uh, faith. That's and right. for, from my perspective, I, I think those are not two, those two things are not mutually exclusive. That's right. We can have both. Okay. Now, I know that generally when we talk about business, people think of um, business as a uh, you know, the kind of business that we see around us. That's right. But we also know that Christ, in his, during his reign, did not run a church, per se. No. Okay? He had his disciples, and uh, the, 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 the entire landscape was his church. That's right. You know, he goes out and performs miracles, and, you know, give blessings, give sermons, and you know, all over the place. It That's was right. not it was not confined to a building. That's right. But as we see with so many other uh, yeah, Apostle Paul, you know, um was out there um erecting not the buildings but you know, supporting churches, growing churches. Now the business aspect me is the way we run the church. That's like right. Today, we have to pay bills. That's right. We have to pay so many other things. We have ministries, you know, to teach the kids, children's ministry, this right. ministry, all these things. And if we don't have a structure that administers those um, entities within the church, that's right. then it becomes difficult for the church to thrive. That's right. So that's why the business comes in, the business acumen, to run the church in an orderly way that will help the pastor execute um, his mandate uh, or the, his calling. That's right. But at the same time, the ministry will be able to take care of the things that needed to be taken care of so that God's word can be preached. That's right. You see? So I think those two can work together. That's true. That, that's where I, I was talking.
that is true because <clears throat> because I was coming to that they said that uh, in the in the in the in the world of business the world the worldly businesses there's no morality in business That's right. but in the church business there is morality in business so 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 I, I'm so happy that uh, you 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 have tried as much as possible to differentiate between the the, the two business because definitely we we need to have business acumen in order to be able to be a good steward in the church because whether we like it or not the church is God's business and it has to be run with people that are competent to do that and they have to be trained. But when it is now being run, it's because there are two, two different entities. One is a, a Christ-centered church and the other one is a man-centered church. In the man-centered church, there's no morality in business. So they run the church in the same way they run their own business in which they follow the 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 um the 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 the, the, the worldly wisdom to run a business so 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 that's that there's no compassion there's nothing at all everything is to maximize the profit so 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 that they are profit oriented and that is how to make how to to take the best advantage of the congregation and how to to, to multiply but in the christ centered a, a, a church it is also run a business that is also successful for the good of the church where everybody is empowered and everybody is a ginger to work hard for, for the good of the church so so and that is where we have to have a kind of more training for our own leaders so so, so that they can be able to grow spiritually and, and at the same time to grow because one thing is if they are adequately trained in the word of God in the how to run the God business it will even be a benefit to them in their own private life too so so I'm happy for that one so now does anybody else want to share any any experience with us before we, we before we now go into the, the Christ type of leadership a, a, any experience of miracle any, has anybody experienced it before Pawaka, Edward Bank, have you ever experienced miracle before or heard about it before? Edward Bank, you see around? Okay, now, what is Christian leadership? Now, what is a Christian leadership? Because because it said the the the, 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 the Bible went forward again. Okay? It said <clears throat> Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And do not be carried away with various and strange doctrines. Now, what should a Christian leader be like? And there is no finer example for Christian leadership than our Lord Jesus Christ. He declared, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep, as we read in John 10, 11. So it is within this verse that we see the perfect description of a Christian leader. He is the one who acts as a shepherd for those sheep that in his, in his care. When Jesus referred to us as sheep, he was not speaking in affectionate terms, in truth. Sheep rank among the dumbest animals in creation. A stray sheep still within earshot of the herd becomes disoriented. If you have if, if you have ever been noticing or you've been going to farm before, you will see that sheep they, they easily get lost, confused, frightened, and incapable of finding its way back to the flock. And that is what the, the parable of the lost sheep, Jesus Christ said, when he said, when, when, when one sheep gets lost out of 99, out, out of 100, he said he will leave the 99 and go and look for the one that's been lost. So unable to ward off hungry predators, 
the stray is perhaps the most helpless of all creatures. They just stand there as helpless. So entire herds of sheep are known to have drowned during times of flash flooding, even in sight of easily accessible higher ground. What we are saying is that a, an entire herd of sheep a, a, and, a, and it was raining and the flood was, 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 was building up, was building up, instead of the sheep to move to the higher ground, they just stood there and they all got drowned. Ghosts will not do that, cats will not do that, dog will not do that. And that's why Jesus Christ called all of us sheep. <clears throat> now, we may be saying, ah, but am I a sheep? Like it or not, when Jesus Christ called us sheep, he was saying that without a shepherd, we are helpless. Can we do without Jesus Christ? I don't think so. So the shepherd is one who has several roles in regard to his sheep. He leads them, he feeds them, he nurtures them, he comforts them, he corrects them, and he protects them. He leads them, he feeds them, he nurtures them, he comforts them, he corrects them, and he protects them. And that is the work of a shepherd. That is the work of every leader in the church. Elder, pastor, or anybody that is appointed to, to lead any ministry. So the shepherd of the lost flock leads by modeling godliness and righteousness in his own life and encouraging others to follow his own example. Of course, our ultimate example and the one we should follow is Christ himself. The Apostle Paul understood this. He said, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ as he wrote in 1 Corinthians 11.1. 1. Now, the Christian leader is one who follows Christ and inspires others to follow him as well. The Christian leader is also a feeder and a nourisher of the sheep and the ultimate sheep food is the word of God. He feeds them with the word of God. Just as the shepherd leads his flock to the luscious pastor, so they will grow and flourish. So the Christian leader nourishes his flock with the only food which will produce strong, vibrant Christian. The Bible, not psychology. The Bible, not the world's wisdom. It is the only diet that can produce healthy Christians. Man does not live on bread alone but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord, as we read in Deuteronomy 8.3. So which means that it is incumbent of every leader to be vast in the word of God. You cannot give what you don't have. And that's why it is very, very important for every leader, deacon, deaconesses, elders, to be, to, to, not to joke with the Bible study class to come to Bible study because you learn a lot. And then he said, this Christian leader also comforts the sheep, binding up their wounds and applying the balm of compassion and love. Jesus Christ did that. As the great shepherd of Israel, the Lord himself promised to bind up the injured and strengthen the weak as we read in Ezekiel 34, 16. As Christians in the world today, we suffer many injuries to our spirits. And we need compassionate leaders who will bear our burdens with us, sympathize with our circumstances, exhibit patience towards us, encourages us in the world, and bring our concern before the Father's throne. Just as the shepherd used his crook to pull a wandering sheep back into the fold because you always see a shepherd carrying his rod, which is what you call a crook. He doesn't use that that rod to to lean upon, but use it to direct the the, 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 the sheep back into the flock. So the Christian leader corrects and disciplines those in his care when they go astray. Without rancor or overbearing spirit, but with a spirit of gentleness, as we read in Galatians 6 2. So, those in leadership must correct according to scripture principles. Correction or discipline is never a pleasant experience for either party. 
but the Christian leader who fails in this area is not exhibiting love for those in his care. The Lord disciplines those he loves, as we read in Proverbs 3, 12, and the Christian leader must follow his example. Now, as a leader, let me ask a question again. Has anybody has any problem before in discipline, or, or do you enjoy disciplining people? Uh, Elder Osman, how do you find disciplined people under your care? Do you enjoy it or, or have you ever had any experience where you discipline you discipline the way you should discipline but, but uh, it didn't go down well? Oh, I've had many absolutely. You know, we are human. That's right. Definitely, we have to do whether 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 we like it or not. A good leader must discipline must discipline when 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 the the uh, 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 occasion calls for it. But you must be guided by the scripture of God that that is must discipline with love. And then the final role of Christian leader is that of protector. The shepherd who was lax in this area soon found that he regularly lost sheep to the predators who prowl around and sometimes among his flock. The predators today are those who try to lure the sheep away with false doctrines. As we are, as, 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 the, as the scripture he told us, he said, do not be carried away in verse 9. Do not be carried away about with various and strange doctrines, for it is good that the heart be established by grace, not with food which have not profited those who have been occupied with them. The role of the Christian leader is that of a protector. And any shepherd who lacks in this area soon found that he regularly lost sheep to the predators who prowl around. And sometimes among his flock, the predators today are those who try to lure the sheep away with false doctrines, dismissing the Bible as quaint and old-fashioned, insufficient, unclear or un unknowable. And these lies are spread by those against whom Jesus Christ warned us. He said, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves, as we read in Matthew 7.15. Our leaders must protect us from false teachings of those who will lead us astray from the truth of the scriptures and the fact that Christ alone is the way of salvation. Jesus Christ said, I am the way the truth and the life and no one comes to the father except through me as we read in John 14 16 so a final word on Christian leaders comes from the article that we are going to submit to you is that under the plan of God God has ordained for the church leadership is a position of humble loving service church leadership is ministry not management those whom God has designate, designated as leaders are called not to be governing monarchs, but humble slaves, not slick celebrities, but laboring servants. Those who will lead God's people must above all exemplify sacrifice, devotion, submission, and loneliness. Jesus Christ himself gave us the pattern when he stooped to wash 
his disciples' feet, a task that was customarily done by the lowest of the slaves, as we read in John 13. If the blood of the universe will do that, no church leader has a right to think of himself as a big week. So, so, so I'm going to try as much as possible to make it available for us, so that so that all of us can can, can read it and, and then go through it again because they are very very important. So I'm, I'm, I'm sure we have been blessed with that. Is there any, any question before we, we pray? Let us mind. Can you pray for us? Thank you. the grace together. May the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the love of God and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest remain and abide with us all now and forevermore. Amen. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives and we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Elders Man. Thank you, Power Thank you. Thank you, Elder Ben. <laughs> Thank you so much. God bless you all. Thank you so much. So we, we can go back to the election now. <laughs> Good night. Good night. God bless you. Amen. Mm. <coughs>